Welcome to the Midlife Misters podcast, your podcast for inspiration on being bold and saying yes to making the most of your midlife. We're so glad you joined us today for this episode. We'll be interviewing Lisa Battaglia, author of the two novel Midlife Romance series, and the two novels are Awake and Second Chances. Um, Lisa, welcome. Thanks for being with us today. So you all today, thank you for having me. And I'd like to introduce the other Midsters that are here. I'm Leslie Ann. I'm Mary Ann. I'm Marla. And our two friends, Carmen and uh, Michelle, could not join us for this uh, for this episode today. So before we talk about your books, which I'm really interested to explore, I want to talk a little bit about you. And you and I have known each other for about 30 years. Yeah, a long time. long time. And the Lisa that I remember meeting way back in the early 1990s is not the Lisa that I see sitting here today. And we talked about that a little bit in the hallway. Your energy is different. You're just, you present so differently. And so you've had like a big transformation in your life. And I want you to tell us a little bit about that. So I thought maybe we'd start with life before you became a novelist. Actually, interestingly, I did write a novel in my old life. Oh. Um, when Caroline, my youngest, who's now 21, went to school, I sat down and wrote a novel, um, which I self-published. Um, and interestingly, um, my ex just somewhat sparked my new, my new story. Um, Never read it, <laughs> notwithstanding that even his psychiatrist said, you know, you should really read that novel that he <laughs> read it. But anyway, I had written another book. So so there was some writing in there. There was some curiosity about writing. And and maybe more importantly, that curiosity came from kind of a place of darkness. I also had a major depressive episode. I was still married, tail end of my marriage. Looking back, that was probably very significant. And um, one way of sort of navigating that medication, which helped tremendously. And then um, I decided to write, you know, to do something. It was, it was, you know, a lot, of, we've, we all do these things. I had stopped working and I definitely think that was the best thing for my kids. And I'm so, so grateful I had that, that opportunity, but you don't recognize what you give up. And I, I gave up a big part of me and myself. And I think I, writing for me was a way of of gaining that back, but without, you know, restarting a career at that time. Cause my, my kids still, my kids have a lot of needs and, and I just wanted to be there for them. Because what was your career, Lisa, at that I time? I was an attorney. Um, I'd worked for three years at a, at a law firm, did not like that. And then I, and then I went to the department of education and I loved my job. I was the attorney at the general counsel's office in, tit- in charge of title nine, the gender yeah. equity law. And I was there the entire Clinton administration, and it was a very exciting, very dynamic. And we were, you know, writing all kinds of policy. And I re- really loved my job, and I loved that it gave me work-life balance. And I loved when I would drop Matthew off at daycare at the Justice Department. I mean, I loved the whole thing. Was, my, my ex was Justice Department, so we could use that. And we took Metro. And when he cried when I left, I said, you know, Mommy's got some other people that need her, too. And I, re- I liked that. Yeah. Um, and I and I probably lost more of that than I you know than I realized. And then everything changed. And then everything changed. Um, I mean, I really did have a kind of like a traumatic. In some ways, I, I never I've never really thought of it as a traumatic experience. But you know, I woke up one Sunday morning in November of 2010, the night before having attended the bat mitzvah of one of my um, ex husband's uh, partners. Hold hands, danced. And that morning, he paced at the bottom of the bed, and he said, "I'm leaving. I'm. I've seen a lawyer. I've rented a house, and I'm leaving. And we're telling the children today. I mean, that was the that was the most traumatic part. We're telling the children today, and, and we did. I mean, somehow we did. We got through that day. I don't know how. What really took ten years of transformation, and I think this is important. Like, I started doing some work during COVID, like all of us, right? I started doing some midlife coaching work with lovely." people with this woman from Australia. It was so funny. She, six, you know, 6 a.m. in Australia on Thursday, Wednesday, two o'clock, wintertime, summertime, you know, we would have these meetings. <laughs> and and I realized, um, you know, that's 10 years. That was almost, that was 10 years from the time that, that, that my Steve walked out. And my first instinct was to just think of those 10 years as all bad. Like just that, like nothing at the nothing had happened like or everything bad had happened or it had all been trauma or I hadn't accomplished anything and um and I needed to kind of 
start now before it was too late. Um, and that's why I was doing this work. But but then I had to stop and sort of wait a second, you know, just like like actually examine that assumption. And and then you realize, oh my gosh, you know, I wrote these novels. I restarted a career. I got my son through addiction and to sobriety. I got my daughter with dyslexia through high school. I um, hadn't moved at that point, but I was, you know, but I bought this house where I now live in Whidbey Island, you know, Washington. It's a brand new life. And I was anticipating that, you know, so it's, so it's interesting. Sometimes I think we don't, we do underestimate both our courage at the beginning. And then even when we've had the courage to do these things, we don't always tell ourselves that story for a while, I think, you know. Do you think, Lisa, well, it sounds like you're blindsided, not just you, yes. but also the children. I, I think it was, um, it was, it was, I didn't want to accept that everything had changed in some ways because it was like a tsunami of, of our whole life and our status and our place in this community and where our kids have been. And it's funny, the first summer, so that happened in November and I remember that summer going um, to the pool and it's, it's a little crazy that I had these thoughts and it's probably something to do with the fact that I'm prone to depression. But I was sitting there and I was really feeling so strongly like I don't belong at this pool. Like this is a pool for families in this neighborhood and families in this neighborhood are intact and mothers stay home and take care of their children and I don't belong here. And I really felt that like really, really powerfully. So some of it may have just been denial. Like I I don't want to process the good things I'm doing because I really wanted to hold on to what I Mm -hmm. thought was the right way to live in this community. And that's a big part of my transformation. I mean, I've just, I don't think I could, I mean, I know you all live here. I don't think I could live here anymore. Like, I think that this place judged me harshly and the expectations of a community like this is a hard place when you're not fitting in Hmm. and when your kids aren't fitting in. I don't think any of us would probably disagree with with the stresses of the DMV area. Two kids who didn't, wanted you know they just didn't fit that track very easily mm-hmm. um i was saying to like to to leslie ann before you know i i felt very um i feel very shunned i felt very shunned as a divorced woman i mean which sounds so old-fashioned right? it does and in just, this world who's thinking it like and you're right? so successful in your career but i, I mean yeah i felt like uh, you know done like the worst deed because you know our kids were going to really be impacted by, by this mm-hmm. And in fact, the kids were. My son had a very, very difficult high school and he was in addiction treatment programs and he was shunned and we were shunned and he was the bad apple and I was the bad mom. You know, it was- I'm sorry again, that you went some through of this, that. I, I, some of this may, again, I, I, I may, right. this may be me. Internalizing. Internalizing sometimes, right? But but I think we would all agree this. there's some fairly narrow and powerful lines of expectations for what we should be doing and what our kids should be doing and um it's not a good narrative in our heads yeah and and, it, and so if you're already in that place exists. where we like you know are pretty self-critical because we are right That's yeah a, right. that is a that's another part of i think midlife transformation is to stop stop holding up everyone else's expectation yeah for us right and also putting responsibility where it lies. I mean, it's interesting that you felt that you had done something wrong and you didn't fit in. You were not at fault. Right. Well, you know, but when a marriage falls apart, you know, there's always, you know, there's always two people. Um, You know, I think what happened looking back is, um, you know, this is another thing I've really learned about midlife values, right? And I and I think my depression was like not living up to a life that I, I I think I had very strong core values about family, the importance of family, I made sacrifices for family, and um and I think I recognized that that was not a shared value ultimately with with my ex ex -husband. ex husband. For him, career was a really much more powerful motivator. Um. So, so it's a lot about, it's a lot about values, right? And then reassessing those values and, and realigning with those values. Um, and that is, there's something else I was going to say, but that is the work. That is the work of, of midlife, I think. So Lisa, do you think that that experience put you on the trajectory for your exciting 
and successful career that you are now, doing now? I mean, absolutely. Um, and it's hard for me sometimes to admit that, saying to Leslie Ann, you know, I... <laughs> I got to give my ex credit for that. <laughs> um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have left. Right. I just. I just feel like I the the val the core value of family of loyalty of what our kids need above what I need mm -hmm. all would have not let me do that. Um, but the authenticity of my life. I mean, so being in a marriage where I felt like I was, I didn't realize at the time, but where I was trying very hard to live up to not just society's expectations, but my but my husband's expectations and what he expected of our kids and what he wanted our kids to look and act and behave like. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, that made, that was making me a very inauthentic parent. I, I just, I just love being with my kids now. Like, I just feel like it's so much more authenticity, authenticity about, you know, what I want to do with my life, what I want to say, who I want to be, you know, that I have a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> How old are they now? Um, my kids, yes, twenty one and twenty five and a half. Okay, so, so friendship. So, so yeah. how, tell us how you managed to get from Washington D.C., where you felt for ten years very uncomfortable, out to Whidbey Island, Washington State, which I I take from my conversation with you and from what I've seen yeah. of you know other things you posted about it is kind of like heaven on earth. It, it is. It's very. It's just um, you know it's the West Coast. It's it's Seattle, you know, a Seattle area, which actually Seattle's gotten pretty pretty intense these days, but it is in Seattle. Um, it's very the nature, you know, you're just the natural beauty is just with you all the time, and everyone seems to be more cognizant cognizant of that. Um, people, people are most people are sort of working towards retirement, so there's a lot of emphasis on community. I'm doing a lot of volunteer work seniors you know there's just like letting people um age at home they're just um it, it's interesting caroline's been with me now for a year she uh she's took a break from college and we often will have the experience of going to do an errand of some sort and we get back in the car and we're like giggling we're like everyone's so nice right? <laughs> I, got, I got did you did you see that it's so nice you know and so there is there is that um but really i got there in part because like of a a romance gone bad. I mean, the original I got to the Seattle area because I started dating someone that I knew from high school and East Coast and college, and he lived out there. Um, and I bought, I was trying to move my life out there and couldn't because my ex wouldn't agree for me to, you know, move the kids, which was probably the right thing. Um, so it was actually all, all an act of kind of desperation and frustration and trying to change things up and I actually really couldn't for a long time um so um but I did buy this house and and immediately panicked and regretted it <laughs> so again so, and my financial advisors told me it was a stupid idea and that and my brother told me it was a stupid idea and um and it probably was and uh thankful and things lucky things happen right so I immediately got someone to rent it once I realized I couldn't move and that held me over for a couple of years. And then they did some short-term rentals. It actually turned out to be like a great investment. And, you know, I'm so happy there. And it it's made, um, it's just feels, it's funny. I was sitting at some music. It's a nice place because there's also a lot of culture. It's a very artistic community. And there's writers and there's artists. My daughter has two paintings in a local store that she did. Um, but I was sitting at a muse at a concert one afternoon by myself, which I do a lot of things by myself. And, um, and I, I had this thought that um, when I I interned in Washington D.C. as a congressional intern my junior year of college, and then I was got a paid internship over the summer. I stayed here for like six months, and I lived on Capitol Hill. And I used to walk around Capitol Hill, and it reminded me of Brooklyn. I, I don't know why. I thought this must be what my dad growing up in like Brooklyn was like. And I, I'd love to live someplace someday where I you know can walk to cultural places and feel part of a neighborhood, but also be part of a city and. The, and like I had this vision of a community, and then I realized for the next thirty years, I never thought about that. I just lived life, right? You just just got through every day, and you know, wound up where we wound up, and just raised our kids because we were here. And I was sitting at this concert and thinking, "Oh my God, I think I am where I thought I was trying to imagine I might be like thirty years ago, like where I might live a life." So, so maybe that was some kind of, unconscious thing yeah, played right? itself out and drew you, you know, to where you yeah. need to be. Those or gut and feelings. I know. I when mean, you are, our gut feelings don't take us down the wrong road often. And it's interesting because, because in some ways, it's like buying this house really was like a 
not not you know wise mm-hmm. decision but but ultimately it was and and so as even then like do i not give myself enough credit for realizing you know i actually could pull, pull it off financially and it was actually a good financial decision in the yeah. end um so yeah you know again trust our we may not trust our instincts and we sometimes let other people you know influence it right when it's true we do know yeah. so you said um something about your subconscious you said something about mm-hmm. not the lisa i knew mm-hmm. um do you really believe that do you believe that you're a different person today or do you believe that you have like your brooklyn feeling that these are things that were always inside of you and now you have to our theme of boldly saying yes you've allowed those feelings and desires and interests and passions of who you are to come out so a little of both right Mm -hmm. like i actually do feel and this is hopeful for all of us a better different and and better and bolder person Mm -hmm. i was a really shy kid i was very shy i was very modest it's funny that i wrote a book pretty spicy sex scenes i mean i i have three sisters and I was always the one that hid and hid back and was, you know, afraid to talk about stuff and refused to talk about stuff. Um, so partly, I just think I have grown into a more mm-hmm. yeah. bold self, mm-hmm. um, and that's through just the hard work of doing stuff, and, and, and it turns out okay, and you realize you've got mm-hmm. power. And, you know, mm-hmm. um, but then some of it is that, you know, in in the um, in the marriage, I, I was working very hard, in, in, you know, to to create a life that maybe wasn't as authentic to right. you know, what I wanted. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it, I think it's a little it's a combination. Um, and I, but I, I'm I'm happy in some ways. I'm, I, it, it is nice to know we can change, right? I know sometimes we hear you know maybe our personality doesn't change and it's pretty locked in, and I, I don't think that's true. I think we really can can become. Um, wiser, bolder. Lisa, can I ask you a little bit about um, your character, the way you approach character development in your novels? Do you bring part of your earlier self and your newer self into that? Does it have any aspects of you and um, the life that you've led? I'm just curious about, because the characters, I haven't read your book, but I I hope to read um, your books. But I know that because of the genre in it, that that would take some time and some thought about really letting those characters be themselves. And I'm just curious about how I you mean, develop so, that character. So actually, I feel like the genre is incredibly superficial, generally, right? I actually chose to write this book trying to like skew the genre a little bit mm-hmm. or challenge, this, maybe challenge the genre's a better way, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, there's there's these tropes, and you know the the, the naive girl and the billionaire man, and rich and poor, uh, you know, boss and employee, uh, friend. You know, there's like you right. Can, you can see that it's like I remember looking. There's 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 subgenres. I mean, there's like really weird weird subgenres, but there's a lot of tropes. And 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 one thing that you often don't read is people in midlife, right? So so I I think I started thinking, oh, I'll, do, I'll write rom- romance novels. They make money. This will be easy. And then, of course, I couldn't write that. Like, I only know how to write about what I've experienced, honestly, in some ways, right? You know, um, it, it does, you know, the characters are having a bi-coastal romance at a time when I was having a bi-coastal okay. romance. They're not, it's not me, right? Right, I mean, like, right. Like, characters, the, this, this amazing thing, like, you start with a character, and they do take on a life of their own and they become their character and they are not, they're not you. I mean, they're you as you, you start, you bring them to life, but they really do kind of speak to you and, and go their own direction. Um, but I do think for me, writing is about exploring, um, l- l- like it's for me, it's how can I, how can I take emotions and experiences and write about them in a way that helps me understand them, mm-hmm. helps them feel universal, helps someone who's reading it feel seen and heard. Um, and so to me, it does often start in my own experience and um, and trying to make that something more un- 
more universal and more beautiful. Like to use right. the, 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 you know, the gift of writing to make it, um, you know, artistic. What, what I think our readers are, oh, I'm sorry, what I think our listeners would be interested in, um, because it's not just romance. There's, these are romance novels with a good, healthy dose of sexual content. And that's something, I mean, you said a minute ago, and I think you're right, in the romance novel field, the idea of like midlife romance is kind of unusual. But I think even more so in the, but I think even more so when you add the sexual content to it. So did you think that that was an area where people, maybe that there was something lacking in that space that needed to be filled? Or was that just a reflection of, hey, that's where I am, so that's what I want to write about? You know, it's, it was a lot of things. It's some some level, it was a challenge as a writer. It was a challenge I gave myself because I think there's a lot of sex that's being written now and a lot of sex on TV, right? Like you, I, I've got this 21-year-old daughter. I feel like I can't watch TV because I'm uncomfortable. Despite writing this book, I'm uncomfortable <laughs> watching this. <laughs> and, and I just thought, can you write it in a way that's still engaging and still interesting and maybe more authentic? because and, and is connected to an emotional story. I mean, to me, the book really is not about sex. It's about sex, sexual awakening as a way that someone can regain a lot of lost parts of their selves. Um, and I do think it was interesting to do that with midlife characters because, again, like the world has changed so fast. So we live in a world where our kids think about sex. I mean, it seems like it's just nothing. It's like no big deal. It's like getting a cup of coffee. I mean, sometimes I just, not everyone, but you know, Tinder and whatever. It's like, it's just, you know, you move in, you live it. And I think it's funny because it's not very, we were just kids not so long ago, but like my parents didn't talk about sex. I mean, my parents got married. They, I'm sure they didn't have sex until they were married. They're Catholic. There's six of us. Um, you know, uh, I was, you know, I didn't know. I, it was, I was very modest. I went to church. I mean, you know, there is, it's it's funny to think like, so could I write about sex in a way that like, how do you how do you capture some of that naivete and modesty in today's world in a way that's you know like believable? Because some people read this and say, what you know, no, no one thinks about like, no, oh, everyone knows that or everyone does that. And like, no, people our age, this is all kind of new for us. So that was partly it, and then and then partly, you know, there is there is empowerment in letting yourself um, feel again, right? I think I think part of when people have bad marriages, often they've stopped feeling and they've stopped having a sexual, you know, connection, and so there's there's that piece. Um, but there's just even if you haven't had, you know, a bad marriage, I mean, there's just there's something, you know, we all kind of. Get, it maybe gets a little stale. I mean, I, I I know a lot of people in marriages who, good marriages, you know, but but the 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 sexual part is totally dropped off, and and I just thought that could be fun for people to to read about that and to see that it could be integrated into into an emotionally complicated relationship. That the sex is part and parcel of what makes it work, what makes it complicated, what makes it challenging, and um, so. Lots of different reasons. Did you have any reservations? Like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this? So, I, no. In some ways, no, which is crazy because I think it probably should have. You know, I probably should have. And my mother. Oh, well, you bought the house. I don't want to And my mother. Fearless <laughs> to me. It's like my mother. I, I don't think of myself as fearless. Really? No. I, I see you as fearless, but I just met you. I, I wrote, so I wrote the book and I actually had a publishing contract. Um, and when I first published it under this publishing contract, which turned out to be a disaster, I used a pen name. And it wasn't so much that I was embarrassed, but my kids at that point were still a little younger. And I'm like, they need plausible deni deniability. I was really like, they can say that's not my mom, right? <laughs> I didn't even use like, my I'm Anne. So it was Lisa Anne Italia, and I, and it was Anne a battle. Italia means battle. I mean, it wasn't like I was trying very, very hard, but just like enough to say, you could say it's not your mom. Um, and actually, Matthew's couple of his girlfriends, friends or girls, had have read it, and uh, one of them's like, oh, you know, your mom rocks." And I think, oh, yeah. you know, he he's also said uh, there was a scene in it in the book where son talks to his mom about um, divorce and, and complications in divorce. And I actually thought he'd really enjoy reading it because we, in our new adult relationship, we've started to finally talk about what happened way back then. 
I'm like, oh, gosh, I think you'd really like this passage in the book. And he's like, I'm never going to read this book, mom. You know that. <laughs> like, like, I mean, and I get it. Of course, he's never, he's never going to read this book. Maybe Caroline, but yeah, he's never going to read this book. I want to, I want to go back, yeah. back to what you were saying about um, the genre and feeling like you were um, filling a void, yeah. in writing about midlife, but not just about sex for the sake of sex, but for emotional connection um, and what your audience or prospective audience might be looking for. Um, has that turned out to be the case? Is what you thought would resonate resonating with them? Or are there other surprises that maybe you didn't expect from an audience? Or maybe you're also hearing from different audiences like this younger generation as well. So I'm, su so I'm surprised some younger people have read it and have, have liked it, which I think is, in fact, my, my daughter's friend on the island, who's um, very, you know, interesting and she's tarot cards and Wic Wiccan and stuff. So like, but she was like, this has transformed me. I, I, mm -hmm. I, this, I, I love you. I, like, love this book. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And she's like 21. I was surprised. But I think, I think maybe we, maybe the world isn't, so different for our daughters, you know. So younger people have seemed to enjoy it, but but I, but another part of the book, um, and you might appreciate this, is the other the other aspect of most romance novels being about young people is that they're at this stage in their life where sort of it's all a blank page, right? And and everything is going to go perfectly because when it's all a blank page and you're that young, you can imagine that it'll all go perfectly, and it does usually for for, for a few years. Um, when you're in midlife and trying to have a romance, it's hard. I mean, it's just, it's a lot harder. Um, it's harder because your body is different and you've aged and you've got to get comfortable getting naked with people with a body that's not what you're used to, right? It's hard because you have kids and it's often hard because they have kids. And I think blending families is one of the hardest things. I mean, I've seen a lot of people do it badly. I've seen my sister do it really well, but because they are just incredibly thoughtful and attentive to it. She's blended, you know, she's got five kids now. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of complications, even just, even just um, being willing to, to, you know, put yourself first again, you know, to, to make the time for romance to make the time to, you know, to let, you know, how do you, you're always worried about your kids. If your kids are still at home and they're young and there's just a constant pressure of like, um, who do I put first, you know, and, and you're not, it's not that you're with someone who's their parent who can you can sort of nego you know negotiate. It's um, it's someone who's not their parent, and so they're doing their thing over there, and you're doing over thing, and you're wondering what you should be doing on their part, and should they be doing on your part, and da da da. And the kids don't like each other. And you know, I was dating this guy um, that got me to Seattle. We went on a couple of vacations, and um, you know, I used to think vacations with my kids was hard. I mean, this was harder at a very different level, you know. <laughs> so Lisa, listening to what you were just saying and the challenges, are these themes that carry over into your book and into your yeah. writing? Yeah, the book is I, I the book is a lot about that. It's okay. about how do you I mean really was trying to be midlife in a really honest way, but it is it is a romance. You know, right. Um there is um so so I, my sister tells me I shouldn't give away the ending, but romance novels have to have a happy ending, right? So there's a happy ending, but there's a lot to get through to get to get that happy there. ending. Well, it sounds like there are emotional roller coasters. I have another question for you too. What challenges have you faced as a romance novelist, especially doing erotica? You know, it's-, it's If hard. any. I mean, there's it's hard to, um, I think it is hard to get it published. It's hard mm -hmm. to, I think there's people that just don't want to read sex. And just find sex well, inappropriate as a sort of gut thing. Um, it's just, it's hard to, it's an incredibly hard niche to break into. There's, I mean, there's so much romance that is written every day and published. I mean, there's just a lot of it. And so it's just, it, you know, it's, um, I was listening to your, your author that you interviewed who had written the book about her great, great, great aunt yeah, in the 1700s. Aunt, yeah. yeah. And I, I it, it her journey to publication seemed a lot easier. Now that may not be accurate. But it seemed a lot e easier. It was a really hot, you know, um, hot topic politically, and you wow. know, it was good. And it seems like, you know, romance. Like you, you got to. You really, it's hard to convince someone that yours is anything different than. But you did else. it. I did it, and I, you know, and I, um, and I, 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 I would love to reach a bigger audience. I, I think the. So this is the problem with my book. I, I think it's not a book 
that I think the people I want to read it wouldn't normally read romance. Mm. Right. And that that's the crux of it. So how do you get that message right. out? I mean, I just try. You know, it's 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 for people that it's it's more it's more than a romance. It's more than sex. Mm-hmm. It's really about a midlife awakening. It's about how we confront these disappointments and how we pass them and how we uh, learn to feel confident again and how we stop that negative talk and how we allow the good things in our life to finally open us, you know, to, that, that those those they're true themes you know yeah in and i lives. and but people they will say i don't know well, romance romance is you know is silly and it's superficial and it's trashy and and this does have you know as lots of sex scenes in it and so um so that's that's just that's what's tough yeah it makes it a hard sell there's there's one aspect of this which i think is um fascinating that we haven't touched on which is that that you published your two books at the same time that your sister published did, a book right and you and I were talking a little bit about that. So can you tell us a little bit about her book and how it relates to your book? It, it was It's a very sweet thing because she's my baby. So I have five brothers and sisters and she's my baby sister. She's like nine years younger than I am. And I always kind of took care of her. She was like my my um, charge, you know. Um, and it was purely accidental in many ways. Like So so my sister's a career counselor and she wrote a book called, um, it's, it's a pun or it's a sort of twist on what colors your parachute. It's called know this by heart but a purple parachute and it's, it helps women it's a it's a step-by-step helping women sort of rethink their career in midlife which I of course don't think of her midlife because she's 51 I'm like that's which is so interesting like what is midlife right, right. Mm-hmm. I'm 61 now like midlife's your baby still that's right we're um, redefining right. Midlife right. All that. Right. it keeps getting it keeps getting wider as we will you know get go into it um but we were um Turns out we actually used some similar helpers in getting them published, and we just and we realized we actually could probably publish this on the same day, and and we should do something with that. And my mom decided she wanted to throw us a little party, it was wonderful, and we had a little event at our our town uh, bookstore because you know we both went back to to town for this party. Um, and as we were thinking about it, we we actually kind of realized we did have this common theme, which is. We, we came up with our, our little catchphrase was, you know, transform, midlife transformation in the boardroom or the bedroom. And it was a way of realizing it. And, and, and that we had themes like her, she has these, you know, 10 things that women do that are wrong. <laughs> they shouldn't do, you know, downplay their strengths, not embrace their superpowers, you know, uh, d- d- you know, downplay what their accomplishments um, um those kinds of that that constant mm-hmm. thing, there. and we're like, yeah, this is like you know, the, this is these are similar themes in both the books. How do you kind of get past that? Um, reinvent, find that courage, uh, embrace your superpowers, move forward. Having been through all that you've been through, mm-hmm. the breakup of the marriage, your sort of ten years of sort of just struggling to get through what was in front of you, and then the move, the publishing, and everything that's happened since. What would you say is the biggest message that you've taken from that that's going to guide you through the rest of your life? Um, the, it's a hard, it's a, so I'm going to answer in a backwards way. So, and this is hard to talk about, but my brother, when he was 62, took his life a few years ago. Sorry. And so he didn't, so some of the messages, some of my lessons are, in relation to that like what is the difference what why did he get to this time of transformation and he had lost a job and his kids you know moved out of the house why did he he was his marriage was ending like all these things that could have been transformationally powerful were to him overwhelming and you know what is what is the difference there and some of it i think maybe because we're women and we are strong you know, like let's embrace that. Yeah. We're, we're stronger. We have, we've worked on communities our whole life. We really do because we have to with raising our kids and all these things. So we have these women, mostly women, that we can we can count on. Um, and when we look forward towards our life, we see a life that's going to be filled with community. Still, like in some ways, I think the transformation that opens up is time for that because mm-hmm. a lot of what we're doing keeps us from building those or we do them on a very superficial level because it relates to what our kids needs are so um build you know it just like it's just so 
beautiful. And every day that I wake up and see how beautiful it is to be able to live in this life and and create beauty and be creative. And I just, you know, wished my, you know, like I, it's always it's always in context of like, I wish my brother could have done that. Yeah. It's like every day is a gift and you never it know. It is. And um, makes me make the bo- most yeah. of it though. Yeah, it is true. Lisa, thank you so much thank for your talk. Thank you for having yeah. me. It was been wonderful a- talking. You've been a great. I think this is a wonderful thing because I think midlife is all about women and community. So it is is a fantastic thing that you're doing. And to our community of listeners out there, again, we're the Midlife Midsters podcast. You can find out more about us on our website, AmericanMidsters.com. We thank you for being with us today to listen to Lisa and to listen to um, her story. And um, we hope that you go out there and find some new perspectives and new things to say yes to for yourself.